Greetings, War Thunderers. This is Longshot with you again with my guide to flying the P 47 D 28 in arcade. This tier 3 plane seems to be identical to the D 25, so everything I say in this video applies to both planes, and at present they share the same arcade battle rating of 3.0. For a single engine fighter, this is a huge plane, which unfortunately makes you a huge target. Now, both P 47s can carry rockets and bombs for ground attack purposes, but in this video I'll concentrate on using it in a pure fighter role, so I'll be leaving those things in the hangar. It's armed with eight wing mounted M250 cal machine guns, which in theory should be more than enough to take down enemy aircraft. Okay, let's take a look at the armour on this plane. There's quite a lot of shielding both in front of and behind the pilot, who seems quite well protected in head on situations or when someone's on your six. And for, unfortunately, both scenarios, head ons and enemies on your tail, occur more often than you'd like in this plane. The internal components are quite interesting. Underneath and in front of the pilot are large fuel tanks, which are protected from frontal attack by the armour shielding. There's no critical components in the wings at all, although the wings themselves are fairly fragile, so you want to avoid exposing the full profile of your plane to enemy gunfire. If it wasn't for the wings, which are really made of glass, this would actually be quite a tough plane to shoot down. Let's see what it can do in a flight test, starting with its roll rate, which is now quite fast, much quicker than it used to be in fact. Into a horizontal turn to measure the effectiveness of its elevators. And as you can see, the turning circle is wide and it's a long way from catching its smoke trail. This is just not a good turner. But I guess that won't come as a surprise to anyone. I'm going to hold the turn to see how much speed it loses, and it's not too bad, it seems to be stabilising just above 300 kilometres an hour. Next I'll hit up elevator and left rudder together to measure the strength of its rudder. And it wants to climb far more than it wants to turn. The rudder is quite weak on this plane, which rules out manoeuvres such as climbing spirals and hammerhead turns. At low speed it's barely able to turn at all. This is not a plane you want to slow down in during a dogfight. Imagine what a Spitfire would do to you if it caught you in this state. It would not be a pretty sight. Its acceleration from low speed is also quite poor, uh, which is what you'd expect from such a large and heavy plane, I guess. So let's check its high speed handling, and for that I'll put it into a dive. I'll roll the plane so we can see if its ailerons tighten up at high speed, and past 500 km an hour they do start to slow down, but it's still rolling fairly well, even at 700 km an hour. I can't say the same for the rudder, as it locked up pretty much completely at high speed. You definitely have to use roll and elevators only to track targets in a boom and zoom attack. Let's see how much altitude it can regain in a vertical zoom climb, measuring both its energy retention and the power of its engine using WIP. Now the low point of the dive was around 750 metres, and by the time I pass 2,700 metres, I should then be levelling off for a gain of 2 kilometres altitude, which is just pretty average for a boom and zoom plane. However, I'm taking it right up and I'm going to try a stall hammerhead. And as you can see, it wants to flop over backwards rather than turn with the rudder. It does turn pretty quickly though, and the reticle snaps to the mouse cursor without much delay. So if you choose to stall turn, the plane is capable of it. It also pulls up to level flight fairly quickly with the aid of combat flaps. One last test. From a starting speed of 330 km an hour, I'll see how well the plane loops. I used WEP in the climb, but it only just makes it over the top. If you're slower than 330 km an hour IAS, don't try to loop or immelman, you'll only succeed in stalling your plane. So the P-47's a poor turner, can only perform vertical manoeuvres at high speeds, so it's pretty much restricted to the role of interceptor and boom and zoomer, although you need to work around its weak rudder, which will, which will make it difficult to track dodging targets in a diving attack. OK, to start with, let's look at the plane in stock form. I'm flying sideways to the battle after spawning, gently climbing, but keeping the plane at around 280 km an hour. My aim is not to reach bomber altitude as the performance of a stock B-47 up there is excruciating. Instead I'm looking for enemies at low altitude, preferably planes going for ground targets. OK, there's nothing to do over here, so I'll switch back to the other side of the battle. There's targets in the central furball, of course, but I'm not going there in a stock P-47, as I'd simply be dived on and shot down. Speed's up towards uh, 400 kilometers an hour now, which is great. I'll need that speed to close quickly on a target when I spot one, 
Also to escape if an enemy fighter picks me out. Okay, I can see a few planes at low altitude on the eastern side of the battle. An IL-2 and a D-3A-1. There's also fighters up there to monitor, and as it turned out, a BF-109 decided to fly right in front of my guns. Okay, I'll set him a light. That'll have to do. That won't, be, get, won't get me a kill this time. I'll move on and attack the planes down in the valley here, beginning with the IL-2, which is a much greater threat to me than the D-3A-1. I have to be careful to avoid attacking him head-on, as his cannons would make a mess of my plane. Right now, though, he's fixated on strafing a minibase, which is fine by me. And they got a few hits. Now I'm extending away out of danger, keeping my speed nice and high, checking to make sure I haven't picked up uh, an enemy fighter. Coming back for another pass, I'll get a quick shot at the Stuka before stitching on, uh, switching on to the uh, D3A1 as I extend. And he's holding nice and still, so I get a longer burst, and there's my first kill. So that's the basic idea. Long sweeping attacks at high speed, extending out of danger before coming back for the next pass. But here I make a mistake. I want to extend to the right, which is away from the enemy, but the IL-2's there, which means after my attack on the Stuka I'll be turning blind straight in his direction. And this is the inevitable result, which shows how fragile the wings are on this plane. Another thing you may have noticed is I was struggling to do much damage with the default belts. Now, fortunately the ammo belts are on the first level of modifications, so you should definitely research them as soon as possible. Most of these belts are the same as the normal M250 cals, except for tracers, which are pure APIT. In the past, this has definitely been the most effective belt on this plane, so it's what I've used throughout this video. I tried stealth for a while and found it absolutely useless. The choice, I feel, comes down to tracers and universal, which I demonstrated in my review of the Tier 2 US fighters, and right now I'd actually suggest going with universal, as it seems more reliable in setting fires than the tracer belt. But as I said, for the rest of this video I'm using tracers, so you'll get a fair idea of how well they work. The low altitude tactic I showed in the stock level battle is just as effective once your plane's speeded up, and it's especially good on larger maps, like Paradise Island. I've climbed to only 3000 metres, flown to an area that ground attackers typically go for early in the battle, and this battle's no exception. There's a 109 and a P47 down there, so it's time to drop in and pay him a visit. And as I dive in, I'm looking around to make sure a fighter hasn't targeted me. If it has, then I'll either engage or use my speed to run away, depending on what the plane is, but at this stage I'm in the clear. Now, P-47's moving at too sharp an angle for me to hit, and he has someone on his tail already, so I'm switching to this 109. And I'm lucky enough to fluke a pilot kill. Time to take my surroundings as I extend away. P-47's not a threat, just straighten up a little. But that 109 might be. I'm directly flying away from him at over 500 kilometers an hour, but the range is gradually closing, uh, closing, so there's no doubt about it. He's decided to target me. His plane, however, is an F2 without rockets, so the odds are in my favor if I face him for a head-on. He's temporarily distracted by another P-47, and then turns to accept my challenge. My convergence was 400 meters, which is a bit short for head-ons, but it worked well enough on this occasion. Okay, what next? The P-47 is still hanging around at low altitude. I'll see if I can line him up in a diving attack. But the angle of this attack is wrong, and it's going to cause me trouble for quite a while in this battle, as you'll see. He's also looping around a lot, which is going to give me a short firing window. And yes, I couldn't do much damage in that pass. Looping straight over, hoping I can get another shot at him. Now, I do manage to send him a light this time, but it's only enough for an assist. But that loop has cost me quite a bit of speed. If I'd had a better of attack angle taking me back towards friendly lines, I would not have had to loop. And now I'm in a potentially dangerous situation at low altitude and low on speed in the middle of the battlefield. I decide to extend and run towards my fighter spawn, and I picked up this biplane on the way. Looks like someone else is shooting at him as well, but that's just a graphics glitch. Seems to have been introduced in the latest patch. Okay, he's down, and I'm whipping into a gentle turn towards a B-25 and a Zero who are dogfighting with a couple of friendly fighters along with a quick check to make sure my tail's clear, which it still is. The Zero is obviously a dangerous enemy for, it to, uh, for me to engage without much of an energy advantage, so I'm building up as much speed as I can on the approach. Basically, I'm hoping to catch him by surprise. I'll gain just a bit of altitude before I commit to the attack. Okay, here we go. And just as I'm opening fire, he sees me and ducks under my guns. 
Nothing I can do about that other than extend away to safety, taking a deflection shot at the B-25 along the way. In the good old days of patch 1.39 and 1.41, the B-25 would have been a smouldering wreck after that burst, but I did manage to send him a light and that was enough for the kill. Still fast enough to loop over, which preserves my speed. Now I'll see what I can do about the Zero. In doing this though, I'm flying back again towards enemy lines without a great deal of speed and I'm quite low. He ducks under my guns, but he's chasing the other guy, not trying to avoid me, so I can follow him and set him alight. And now I pay the price for that lack of awareness, I haven't looked around much at all, and my low uh, height and speed, as I'm intercepted by a P-39 and the 109 F-2 pilot I shot down earlier. I pulled into a hard break to avoid the guns, and force an overshoot, and then I'm running as fast as I can. The Aero Cobra has overshot badly, I don't see him again, but the 109 is now stuck to my tail. Now my options here are quite limited. I can't outturn the 109, nor can I outrun him, I'm far too low and slow. What I can do is dodge, and the most effective way to do that in the P-47 is to use its excellent rolling ability. I'm mixing snap rolls with sudden pullbacks on the elevator to change direction. This is keeping him from getting an easy gun solution. I'm presenting the smallest possible target by not exposing my wings, and every second is taking me closer to friendly fighters and eventual rescue. 109's now been shot down, but an I-16 Type 27's taking this place, so I need to keep running. But he's struggling to keep up, and I can simply fly away from him. So that was a very lucky escape from a bad situation. And I got myself into that position firstly by looping to attack the P-47 after a bad attack angle, and then continuing to attack a Heinkel 51, a B-25 and an A6M2 in succession, all without regaining any altitude and crucially without checking my surroundings. In this battle I got away with it, but if you make a habit of getting low, slow and blind like that, the chances are you'll find yourself flying without wings on a regular basis. Anyway, now I've climbed. I'm able to re-engage the furball with an altitude and speed advantage, and that lets me pull off intercept attacks like this. You have to roll the plane to match the target's heading. Don't rely on the rudder to adjust your aim, as it's simply too weak. I've climbed again and I'm ready for another intercept uh, diving attack, this time on the I-16. And just with that bit of altitude advantage and the speed from the dive, I have all the odds in my favour. And then I extend away to safety. So in this battle the tracer belt performed fairly well, netting me 7 kills, but that won't always be the case. Watch what happened in this next domination battle. Left quite a few rounds on targets, and damage to his central gear leg. A P-40 set alight in this oblique head-on pass. He put the fire out, and I got another assist. A KO-49 satellite for a third assist, although he did have a kill train on his tail, so that's fair enough. A Spitfire shot down before my long stream of bullets could do any damage to him. And then I accidentally rammed the friendly plane and shot him down. At least I'm flying, unlike the other guy. I set a zero alight in this high-speed uh, intercept attack. Surely that'll be a kill. There he goes. Extending away out of danger. And nope, he put the fire out. Now I'm getting a bit desperate, and that's leading me to take some silly risks. Like flying through the middle of the battle at low altitude, and not that high a speed, to finally take down an enemy plane in the form of this bow fighter. and that still took a while. A kill at last, and then I had a lot of dodging to do to escape two fighters that latched onto my tail. A KI-27 flying nice and straight to cap our airfield. Surely I can shoot him down. No, I can't. Assist number seven. So that was 26 hits, 5 criticals and 1 kill. That's not the kind of firepower you're looking for in an interceptor that usually gets brief firing windows. Anyway, so far I haven't shown the plane at high altitude, and what better way to do so than an air domination battle? Occasionally it's worth climbing in ground strike if there's a lot of high altitude bombers, but in air dom the equation is simple. If you want to survive and be effective in this plane, then you need to climb. 
and maintain an altitude advantage throughout the battle. Now this plane's only an average climber, so I'm flying out to the side and keeping my speed between 260 and 280 kilometers an hour. And as I do so, it's probably a good time to summarize my thoughts on the P-47. Firstly, it's definitely not a turn fighter. You need to engage at high speed, using its excellent, excellent roll rate to uh, track your targets. Hence you'll need to climb both at the start and between each engagement. Keep it simple. Intercept targets, then get away and prepare for the next one. If someone wants to go head-on and they don't have cannon, it's worth taking the risk. If they have cannon, then avoid the head-on if you can, as the chances of losing your wings are just too high to make it worthwhile. And if you get in trouble, don't try to turn fight or manoeuvre at all. Simply cut and run using your roll rate to dodge their gunfire. Anyway, back to this battle where I've been shadowing a climbing typhoon, and I've decided it's time to dive in and attack. He's flying directly away from me, which is the ideal angle, but then he pulls a left turn, and I'm going to wait for a moment before turning to follow. If I tried to lead his turn, I'd probably just overshoot, but that's brought me out right on his tail. Perfect to attack at convergence range. And it's only enough to set him alight, but Tiffy's rarely ever put fires out. And now I'm hitting Web and climbing to regain the altitude I lost in the attack. I have just enough energy left to emblem one over and level out back at 4,500 metres. In air domination, suppressing climbers while maintaining your own altitude is not only an easy source of kills, it's also extremely important to your plane's survival and your team's chances of winning the battle. You've got to be constantly on the lookout for potential targets. Don't be too passive up here as the speed you generate in a dive is usually all you need to get you in and out of the combat zone, combat zone quickly. On this occasion the targets didn't line up. I didn't want to go too far below 3000 metres, so it's time to abort the attack and extend up into a zoom climb. Yes, this takes time. It can feel like the battle's going on without you. But relax, these games go for as long as 20 minutes. There's absolutely no need to lose patience, dive too low, and get yourself killed. Squeezing out the last drops of energy to Immelman and level off, back at 4,500 metres. Sometimes you'll be all alone up here, but that's not the case in this battle. I have two friendly 109s keeping me company. Bombers, of course, are a little more than a little more than free kills if they stay at their spawn altitude. In this case, I'm not going to follow the diving Stuka, but I'll happily help myself to this Focke-Wulf 200 with its huge load of fuel tanks. Just checking beneath me for any climbing fighters. At the moment, there don't appear to be any. I'm sorry, Mr. Bomber. It's time to take your medicine. Please don't blame me wasn't my decision to design a mode which has absolutely no, real, no role for bombers, especially one as defenceless as a Focke-Wulf 200. OK, a Stuka spawned in and he's fixated on the Zoom Climbing 109, but I'm beaten to the punch on this one. And it's well past time for an update on my situational awareness. Even if you think you have control of high altitude, it's always worth scanning the, the sky above you. It's so easy for someone to climb way off to the side. And then the first you see of them is when they're diving at you while you're zoom climbing. Looking down I can see a KF-45 inching his way up, and to a lesser degree so is a Yak-7. So I think it's time to dive in and make my presence felt. But my angle's a bit steep. And steep dives like this are not really ideal. Chances are you'll only get a very short firing window. And this guy sees me coming and dodges and I can only scratch his paint. I'm now well below my minimum dive height of 2,500 metres or so. I've decided to continue on and shoot down this BB-1. and It's got me very low. That's all well and good but now I have a lot of altitude to recover. I just have to hope the two 109s are still up there holding the fort while I'm gone. So I'm anxiously watching those two while I zoom climb. By the time I've crept up past 3,500 metres uh, Yuki Kazi seems to have gotten into a bit of trouble. A bit low in a diving tack like I was, but unlike me, he's going to pick up several bandits on his tail. There's precious little I can do to help right now. I'm a long way away, still very low on speed, and needing to recover more altitude. There he's off to the right. And while I'm clawing, clawing my way back up, the other one and I dives into the furball. I'm not sure if he's coming back up, so I decide to try and help Yuki Kazi if I can. And to be honest, I'm not driven entirely by altruism in this. The planes he's dragged up here will possibly make good targets if I can surprise them. 
and also represent a direct threat to me if they manage to establish, establish themselves at this altitude. Okay, so it's a spit in the 109 only. And I'm hoping Yuki can continue his zoom climb and that these guys develop serious tunnel vision. But it's not to be, they've caught him and he's forced to dive. And if he keeps a bit of altitude, I might be able to latch onto at least one of these guys. Probably the Spitfire, as it's a bit higher. But that's a lousy attack angle. I can only critical his left flap. With Cannon, I'd have ripped that wing clean off. But as it turns out, that was enough to put the Spitfire out of action. He begins a long, slow descent to the ground, where he finally crashes his plane. Of my two 109 friends, the guy with the Chinese name is still around, but he's obviously intent on pushing lower. Uh, Yuki's still alive as well, so things are looking pretty good. And that goes to show how tenuous an altitude advantage can be. Why you need to be disciplined with the depth of your diving attacks in this plane. As I watch, the Chinese 109 has now gotten himself too low. Looks like he's diving to ground level, then he dies in a head-on with a Dornier 217. And as I look around, I see Yuki is always also on his way down while trailing smoke now. So now I'm alone up here. Except, of course, for a climbing A6M2, who appears to have targeted me, and a climbing 109 beneath him. The Zero is my main concern right now, and I'm flying above him, hoping to get him to climb sharply and stall his plane. And he's moving slowly enough that I decide to risk a diving attack. But I have absolutely no luck. Extending away to gain separation before I start climbing again. Gives me another chance to look around. The A6M2 is trying to chase me, but he has nowhere near enough speed to keep up. And looks like he might have given up and dived away. Well, the kill would have been nice, but I'll settle for remaining in control of high altitude. And there was a sudden skip just then, as I had to get up and answer the phone. OK, so I'm now up past 5,000 metres and above their bomber spawn, a long way from the action. I need to get back into it. And finally the Spitfire I winged earlier hits the dirt. Central furball still bubbling away. There's no enemies at altitude to contend with, so I'm thinking of diving on the Dornier 217 down there, but it's a long way down, so I decided to wait a bit longer. And that wait was rewarded as a couple of bombers spawned in. An SPD and an SB2M, neither of which is a threat to me, and both of which make excellent targets. Just a question of whether they choose to hold their altitude or dive into the furball. Looks like the SB2 is diving, so I'll go for the SBD. His pair of 50 cals could do a bit of damage if I ignored him, I guess. He's happy to accept the head-on, which is grossly weighted in my favour. Forget the SB2M, there's two more bombers to go for over here. There's a potential problem, though, the other team could easily cap the zone if I stay out of it for too long. Okay, starting my journey back. Just hope my team holds on. G4M1 there hasn't dived yet, and the SP2M is also still at altitude. It really is Christmas right now with all these bombers spawning in. I decide to turn back and have a shot at one of these two. The KO-49 is a little higher, so he's the obvious target. Bad attack angle. But I'm lucky enough to set his wing alight. And that's usually enough to destroy a 49. Now I could have been a bit more aggressive there and turned to attack the TBF-2, but I'm sticking to the Boomin's end strategy, and you can see the value of doing so as I suddenly see a Spitfire has climbed a little too high for comfort. So now it's time to build my altitude, fly back into the zone, and take the Spitfire on. I cannot afford to let him engage me on equal terms, or even worse, with an energy advantage. He seems fixated on a friendly G4M1, and I'm hoping it stays that way, and he won't see me coming. And this is what I love about Arcade. The constantly changing picture, so many moving parts that you have to take into account in every decision that you make. OK, the G4M1's having to turn and dogfight him, which isn't ideal from my perspective. I don't know where the Spitfire will be when I get there. I'm ignoring all the bomber targets for now. The Spitfire is my only focus. They're closing at high speed, but he's seen me. He's turned off the G4M and possibly coming into her head-on. No, he's 
dropping underneath and dodging. So I'll lift up into a zoom climb. I still have the energy advantage. Uh, all his manoeuvring has robbed him of the speed to follow my climb, but he's close enough to present a massive threat right now. He still seems interested in the G4M1. I wonder if I can catch him napping with a diving attack here. Nope, he's watching me closely. He reacted instantly. I'll continue the approach just to see how he responds. He ducks under my guns, but I managed to grave some paint off his wings. And now I have to extend away and regain my altitude advantage. But as I do so, I see he switch to Yukikaze, who's climbed back up here in another 109. I go straight into a loop, hoping to re-engage. I need to see that his switch to Yuki was fake, and he's approaching for a head-on, which I have no choice but to accept. And I was bloody lucky to get away with that. You saw what happened going head-on with an IL-2 earlier. Well, the same thing could have happened then, but fortunately for me, he was a bad shot. Even more fortunate that he didn't just evade my head-on and then turn on me before I could fly away. And that was pretty much the last throw of the dice for the enemy team in this battle, with only bombers spawning in attempting to stop us captain capping the zone from here on. So what are my thoughts on the P-47 as a fighter in Arcade? Well, to be honest, it's not my favourite plane. Although, in spading the D-28 from scratch for this video, I didn't do too badly in it. I love its roll rate. Its damage model's not bad either. But I find its energy retention isn't as great as reputation would have you believe, and its sustained climb speed can be a problem in arcade which tends to reward fast climbing planes, due to small maps and fast battle durations. Lastly, it's greatly affected by how reliable its guns are, in relatively short firing windows. And at the moment they're a bit lacking compared to cannon, but that's just my opinion, that's something everyone needs to try for themselves, as the effectiveness of ammo seems to vary wildly from one person to the next and one patch to the next. I do like that it can survive rams, from the LA-5 as shown earlier, and a fog of 190 that tries to fly through me here, in his attempt to kill that pesky Blenheim. Well, I do hope the video has been informative, and helps you get the most out of your P-47s. If all else fails, you can always put rockets and bombs on it and go tank busting, or perhaps fly the P-51 instead. It's a very similar plane, armed with four Hispanos, which are far more destructive right now than 850 cals. But that's all I have for you in this video. Stay fast and stay safe, and I'll see you in the skies.